I want this evening to talk about um, what I think is arguably the most important uh, international development um, that's taking place kind of under our eyes and during the course of our lifetimes. I've entitled it China and the New Global Order, Taking the Long View. Um, taking the Long View is something that I think China does. Um, it's uh, going to be something that I'm going to try and do now. In other words, I'm not going to talk about um, short-term issues. I'm not going to talk about uh, how much investment gets uh, mobilised in the course of the next 12 months under the heading of the Belt and Road Initiative. I'm not going to talk about uh, how Theresa May gets on in her visit uh, to China, uh, which is, uh, I think she's in the air on the way as we speak. Um, I'm not going to dwell on uh, short-term issues like even uh, the slightly vexed question of market economy status and all of that. I want to take a much longer perspective on the way in which China is engaging uh, with the wider world. And I start with what may seem to you to be a slightly odd uh, starting point. Because in February of last year, February 2017, there was a UN resolution passed um, it concerned the 55th uh, Commission for Social Development um, and amongst the various requirements specified in that resolution was one which called for, quotes, more support for Africa's social and economic development by embracing the spirit of building a human community with a shared destiny. Why am I quoting those words to you. They are slightly odd words. And they were barely noticed in the Western and the international media. But I want to explain to you that they are, in fact, evidence of a groundbreaking new uh, um, initiative. Um, you might say that they're evidence of the shape of things to come. Because they're one of the two uh, officially approved, or certainly officially used, English translations of the Chinese phrase, which is one of the two central elements in what we now know as Xi Jinping thought. The other one, by the way, is the community of the shared future of mankind. So a common destiny or a shared future, either phrase gets used. And that UN resolution is an early example, I would suggest, of Xi Jinping thought becoming part of the rhetoric, part of the administrative language, if you will, of the United Nations and therefore more broadly of the international community. Like I say, the Western international media didn't pay this a great deal of attention. As far as I can tell, I'm not even sure it paid it any attention. But Xinhua certainly did. And if you Google Xinhua's commentary at the time and subsequently, you can see a very clear interest in the use of those words. Uh, in that UN resolution, and indeed there have been subsequent UN res resolutions which have done the same thing. Why am I dwelling on this? It's because Xi Jinping thought has two related but separate focuses. And I want just to talk through some of this. Uh, well, I have a number of Chinese friends in the uh, audience this evening, I know. They will pick me up on the detail, uh, I'm sure. Um, and, and in any case, will certainly be familiar with what I am talking about. But I think that many of us, more broadly, will not be familiar with the real impact of Xi Jinping thought. So I want to dwell firstly on its domestic focus, and then secondly, on its international focus. These are not, of course, completely separate topics. They very clearly overlap. But I want to start with the domestic. And the domestic focus was summed up in a phrase which we are, I think, familiar with, socialism with Chinese characteristics for a new era. Only the last bit of that phrase is, in fact, new. Deng Xiaoping championed the idea of socialism with Chinese characteristics more than 30 years ago when he was, of course, launching China's great opening up of its economy, China's great reform, uh, which has transformed not merely China's economy, but so much of the world trading order. For Deng Xiaoping, I suspect, it was a deft way of continuing to honor what you might describe as Marxist metaphysics, 
despite its obvious incompatibility with the circumstances of China in the late 20th century, uh, not to mention the 21st century. And the thesis was that the Marxist journey had three or four stages or phases to it, and that China was in the first phase, a phase which would last a good 100 years. In other words, it was a way of pushing off into the indefinite future beyond the horizon, even by Chinese long-term planning standards of those later phases in the Marxist journey. And it enabled the Chinese uh, government to focus on the fact um, that the difference between capitalism and socialism is not the same as the difference between central planning and markets. As Deng Xiaoping put it, capitalists and capitalist systems have plans, so why shouldn't socialist systems have markets? And that led on to the famous phrase that became uh, almost a cliche, that it doesn't matter what color the cat is as long as it catches the mice. This is socialism with Chinese characteristics. What was new in Xi Jinping's thought is not that part of the phrase, but the additional three words, four or four words, for the new era. Even that's not all that new, but it does perhaps bespeak a renewed emphasis on something which the Chinese authorities and indeed everybody, every other commentator has recognized for some time, and that is that the Chinese economy domestically needs to rebalance itself that is underway to a considerable extent, has been so in recent years, but I think everybody would acknowledge that there is further to go uh, to address some of the inequalities that have developed as a part, uh, since the reform, to address some of the geographic inequalities which plainly still exist in the Chinese economy and society, and to address some of the environmental challenges which have been brought on by strong urbanization and heavy industrialization. More balance, secondly, more innovation, so that China over time will move up the value chain and indeed will tackle the commanding heights of the new technology-based economy. And you see this in all sorts of obvious ways, not least, for example, in, uh, in railroads and trains, but also in aerospace. There is really no sector of economic activity that increasingly uh, the ambition uh, will focus on scaling the, uh, scaling the heights. And then thirdly, more international connectivity. More international connectivity in both directions, more welcoming of foreign investment into China to bring some of that technological expertise which will help the process of development, and more emphasis on Chinese investment in other parts, parts of the world. More globalization in short. And so it was that Xi Jinping, when he went to Davos about a year ago, became the most prominent, most significant statesman advocating globalization. Um, and the contrast at that time was all the more stark between uh, his call for a renewed uh, impetus to globalization and Trump's rhetoric of pulling up the drawbridge. Since then, of course, Trump has uh, feathered his message. It's no longer just America first. Um, uh, at least America first does not mean America alone. But nevertheless, the difference is still rather stark between the message coming from China and the message coming from the Trump administration. And that reference to globalization brings me, therefore, naturally to the second of the two major focuses of Xi Jinping thought, the international focus. I would argue that this is newer than anything uh, that was said uh, in, the, in the context of domestic policy and that it's more strategically significant over the longer term and I want to dwell on this a bit. Xi Jinping not only spoke at Davos last year in a way that grabbed the headlines of the business community internationally, he also spoke at the UN in Geneva uh, shortly after or before Davos, I forget which it was, uh, but he used that occasion to uh, deliver a keynote speech which laid out a new 
Chinese approach to international relationships. And the summary phrase went as follows, that China would work to build a community of shared future, common destiny, for all mankind. It is that phrase that has started to creep into United Nations rhetoric. And I want to take you through the journey that I believe China has been on in recent years to get to that point. Because if you look back some 20 years ago to the early stages of opening up, Deng Xiaoping famously said that China should hide its capacity internationally, should bide its time. It should be good at maintaining a low profile. It should never claim leadership. These are all uh, remarks made by Deng Xiaoping in the 1990s. As time moved on, that position began to shift. It's as if China's been on a journey in respect of its international engagement. And so Hu Jintao, in the year 2012, spoke of China taking a more active uh, role in international affairs and working to make the international order more just and equitable. I'll come back a little later to some of the substance of what that means. He also talked of recognizing a community of shared future or common destiny in China's neighborhood. In other words, that phrase that I've been commenting on is not actually new. It was applied, as I say, by Hu Jintao uh, to China's neighborhood. In 2014, Xi Jinping took that one step forward when he spoke of turning the neighborhood of China into an area of common a community, excuse me, of common destiny. And then last year, at the Party Congress and at the UN, he spoke of the common destiny of humankind. That's the new addition from last year. In other words, China's international relationships, China's foreign policy going global. And the UN resolution shows that the idea is catching on. I don't think this is just rhetoric. I don't think this is a detailed blueprint for how China intends to engage over the next 20, 30, 40 years. But I do think it's something of a vision, something of a manifesto, something of a statement of intent for the way in which China intends uh, to build its engagement over the next generation. Xi Jinping spoke of uh, a, uh, here's the vision statement, if you will, to use business school cliches. Here's the vision statement. An open, inclusive, clean, and beautiful world that enjoys lasting peace, universal security, and common prosperity. And unless you think that's just the sort of thing that vision statements by politicians always say, well, compare Trump's rhetoric. Also note carefully what he went on to say. He went on to articulate some of the specific implications of that general vision. And so he talked about uh, the need for countries to respect each other and discuss their issues as equals. He spoke of the need to promote trade and investment and grow international connectivity uh, through business relationships and he spoke of the importance of recognizing and respecting diversity of civilizations with estrangement replaced by exchange and clashes by mutual learning and superiority by coexistence. It's worth savoring some of those words. The reference to clashes is, of course, a reference to Samuel Huntington and the clash of civilizations. Now, the, of the most obvious outworking of all of this uh, in the near term, and let's say the near term is the next 30 years or so, uh, is going to be the Belt and Road Initiative. It gets more ambitious as time goes by, the Belt and Road Initiative, by the way. Just the other day, uh, there was quite a detailed article um, about the Arctic dimension 
of the Belt and Road Initiative. The idea that, I'm afraid this is due to global warming, the fact that we can even talk of this, that you can open up the Arctic passages from the Pacific into the Atlantic in both directions shows how far the Belt and Road Initiative has developed beyond the original concept of an east-west connectivity through Central Asia. And if you look at Chinese academic literature, you can see quite an active and, and elaborate discussion of the way in which the shared destiny is built up of shared interests and responsibilities, interests because of growing economic interdependence, responsibilities located in the political and security spheres to ensure that that vision of harmonious relationships between countries is realized. There's an explicit contrast drawn in Xi Jinping's speech to the UN with the old post-war mentality. The sense that the old post-war mentality developed in the closing stages of the Second World War uh, and into what then became the Cold War was one which was zero sum. And indeed, he takes what amounts to a swipe, both at the West for the way in which the international system was developed in a way that suited its advantages and at the old Soviet empire in the same sentence. But I do think it's important to recognize that this is not just a matter of slogans or academic philosophizing. You might even describe this as the early harbinger of a new global order which will be influenced much more clearly by China, I'll come on to the role of others in a second, um, than ever before. I do think this is a new and very striking and strategically significant development. And we ought to pay attention to it and think about the long-term implications of the way this will work out because it will affect us all. How do we expect it to play out in the near term, let's say, the next half century? In order to answer that question, I want to take a step back and look backwards for a moment. I want to look backwards actually at the 19th century and the way in which international relations were governed then. Governance, if that's the right phrase, took the form in the 19th century of a concert of powers which was reasonably structured. Uh, the concert of powers was a group of nations who felt that they kind of ruled the, the roost uh, but knew that they had to work together. And there were formal meetings. They didn't take place all that often, but in the course of the 19th century, there were half a dozen of them. Uh, the important first one was at the Congress of Vienna, and the last significant one was the Congress of Berlin in the 1880s. There were six powers that were members of the concert of powers at that stage, four Europeans, Russia, and the Ottoman Empire, Turkey. The formal congresses began, as I say, with Vienna. There were then several minor ones uh, which the British refused to attend. Sounds familiar? Then came Berlin, 1878, uh, when the issue was tension in the Balkans, amongst other things, when Germany was the new and strong power on the block, and even the British recognized that they had to attend. Just seems to me that when you look at British attitudes, some things never change. And the system worked for as long as there was a rough balance amongst these various members of the concert of powers and as long as none of them was expansionist, which was more or less true at that time. It also required that there be no outsider who had no interest in the status quo. And the trouble was that there was an outsider who had no interest in the status quo and was prepared to rock the boat. I refer, of course, to Serbia, which was the immediate cause of the outbreak of the First World War. But all of this allowed the first global capital market and the first globalized economic interdependence to develop. It was a time of massive technical progress, 
a time of massive infrastructure investment, particularly the railways, and a time of massive industrialization. It was, if you will, the Belt and Road Initiative of the 19th century. That was the time when the Trans-Siberian Railroad was built, by the way. It was the time of the Berlin to Baghdad Railway. It was the time of the continental expansion of the US railways. But it was inherently vulnerable. And we know what happened. 1914 was non-inevitable. But the probability of catastrophe was never as low as the markets thought it was. The 20th century marked a great rollback in that globalization. Capital account, of, uh, uh, capital, uh, uh, convert, excuse me, capital account convertibility uh, was abandoned in 1914. And although there was a, an effort to restore it after the First World War, that failed. And effectively, for three quarters of a century, the markets of the world were disconnected and there was a collapse, of course, of the concert of powers. Two of them broke up in 1918. One of them was ruined and then divided in 1945. Two of them had their empires dismantled in the 1950s and 60s. Britain and France, I refer to, of course. And one broke up in 1989. So the 20th century overall was a year, was a century during which the process of globalization was brought to a halt. And the only positive development, if that's the way of putting it, was the emergence of one major economic power that had the strength to see itself through all of this and to put the bits back together, particularly after 1945. I refer, of course, to the United States, which was the driver and sponsor of the post-war international architecture. The United Nations itself, Bretton Woods, NATO, and so forth. The United States emerged in 1945 as the world's only, and perhaps only ever, truly global superpower. But that didn't last either. And in a sense, the post-war order became the victim of its own success. In that, what we started to see, particularly after 1989, is the emergence of new great powers on the world stage, driven by extraordinary economic success. The most obvious, the most important, being China itself. And thus we are seeing the gradual formation, not of a new concert of powers, because remember that had some structure to it, and I don't think we're uh, at a stage in human history where we can say there'll be a new concert of powers, but certainly a new group of great nations. This new group of great nations, I'll call it the concert of powers, is of course no longer Europe-based. Europe is now in long-term relative decline, it's a prosperous market of 500 million people, and that's not going to change, but its governance is famously cumbersome. It's very self-absorbed. It's preoccupied with its internal and regional challenges. The UK may think that Brexit is the most important of those challenges. I'm not sure that it would necessarily top the list of either France or Germany. But it's certainly true that Europe is not in a mood to assert itself on the world stage in any cohesive manner. And in general, the issue of identity plagues Europe and is likely to continue to do so for some time. And in a sense, you could say that Europe is reverting to the role it had on the world stage before about the year 1500. Now, the new concert of powers is Eurasia-based. It's not yet truly global, because I don't think there's any African nation uh, that, that has got the weight, the gravitas, to appear on that world stage, and, and not really any Latin American one either, dare I say it. It's Eurasian-based. And in a way, that's not surprising. Eurasia is 35% of the world's land mass, it's 70% of the world's population, and it's 65% of the world's GNP. It is also the home and origin of all of the world's great cultures, 
I've suggested already that this won't be a new concert in quite the formal sense that the 19th century was, but you can see already which is the group of nations that's going to be on that world stage. The US, of course. It's the only power involved at both ends of the Eurasian landmass. It's still the world's largest economy. And I would suggest that for all its current political travails, you should never short America for very long. Its dynamism, its ability to reinvent itself is nothing short of extraordinary. China, of course. The great new fact of the 21st century is China's positioning on the world stage. China is on a journey economically, which is, let's say, halfway through, such that when it overtakes the American economy in the next two, three, four, five years, that's just a milestone on a journey which will end up with it being not merely the world's largest, but by far the world's largest economy. India, for sure, on that world stage. Economically, further to go. Um, it has its own challenges, but it's soon to be the largest country on the planet. Oh, and as a side, in that rather pointless debate that you sometimes hear about which country has the world's oldest continuous culture, India has a fair claim to be the winner in that its sacred texts are older by far than anything that either China or Europe has produced. And then there are others who are clearly going to be on the world stage. Japan, a country that we don't talk about enough. It is still the world's third largest economy and an extraordinarily sophisticated economy technologically. Russia, not at peace with anyone, any of its borders, uh, neighbors. Uh, Iran, nuclear, Turkey. These are all countries that are going to make their presence felt on that Eura Eurasian and therefore world stage. What about Europe? I don't know. But the big fact is the new arrival in particular of China on that world stage and the relationship in particular between the US and China over the next couple of generations is going to matter to us all. There are three things to note about all of this, I think. Firstly, we should acknowledge the severe limitations of the post-war international order, the post-war international governance arrangements. The United Nations, launched in 1943, the hopes and aspirations were probably naive from the start. It has certainly underwhelmed in, in the impact it has had on world affairs. The Bretton Woods institutions, rather more successful, effective, but clearly still very weighted towards Western interests. It's worth remembering that the I in the IMF, the shareholding of the United States at 17% versus China's at 6%. There is no way that you can defend that comparison um, in any objective assessment of the respective weights of the two economies, let alone the trend over the next 10 to 20 years. The G7, which was the grouping of the powerful countries, it was, if you will, the, 20th, the late 20th century's answer to the concert of powers of the 19th century. Well, the G7 has become increasingly marginalized. The G20 has become the more important body. But the trouble is that whereas the G7 may be too one-sided, the G20 is too big and includes too many countries that are not uh, uh, natural heavyweights on the world stage. And so, therefore, the governance question internationally remains open. And this is why Xi Jinping's view, the, the thought about international relationships, is so timely and so significant. That was my first point. The second point is that there are huge opportunities out of all of this. There are threats, of course, and I'm going to come to those in a minute. But the world trade opportunities are hugely significant. Now, there are skeptics about what the Belt and Road Initiative will really amount to. And the 100 trillion number that gets mentioned, sorry, not the trillion, not the 100 trillion, the trillion number that gets mentioned, um, um, has yet to translate itself into a large number of uh, infrastructure investments on the ground. 
But I think that that cynicism, that scepticism, is taking too short a term a view. Of course this will take decades to realize, but it's nonsense to suppose that there is no economic case for a proper infrastructure investment being rolled out through Central Asia in the first instance, connecting up ASEAN with China and points uh, uh, north of ASEAN in, as a second example. I've mentioned already the Arctic route. I suspect that will never be as significant as the rest. Um, and gradually, what we thought about initially as a, in a rather limited geographic scale is going to take flight as a major investment program of the world at large. There will be bumps on the road, but the direction of travel is very clear. My third point is that there are some significant risks in all of this, and we have to face up to those. There is, for one thing, a rising tide in a whole number of countries of what you might describe as assertive cultural nationalism and there's no point in behaving like an ostrich and pretending that this isn't true in fact in almost every one of the occupants of that world stage you can see this I, I venture to say including in China itself if you listen to the social media chat in China you can tell that there's a pervasive sense uh, a very proper sense amongst the Chinese people very broadly that China's time has arrived. Uh, and if this seems um, odd, I can only say that this is reminiscent of what happens as ha has happened in previous times in history when a, when a country has emerged from relative uh, 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 obscurity to an important position on the world stage. And I think in particular, though I certainly do not imply that the consequences will be the same, of Germany in the 19th century, when there was a very pervasive sense that the country's time had arrived. Dare I say even that the party is not so much a Marxist party as it is a motherland party. Westerners who think that it lacks legitimacy because it's not an elected parliamentary democracy are kidding themselves. There is widespread pride in the achievements of China in the, 20th, in the late 20th and into the 21st century. I look at India. I've just come back from India. I was uh, literally yesterday came back. Uh, um, uh, from the Jaipur Literary Festival and listening to people there talk about some of the challenges they face and that of course is the liberal elite at the Jaipur Literary Festival but nevertheless you listen to them talking about uh, the new assertive uh, Hindutva to give it its uh, um, local terminology um, led very assertively by the Modi government and you get a sense that they're nervous about where this takes the country. I've even, I hadn't heard this before but suggestions that there is a strand of opinion in the BJP that like to rename the country Hindustan. Russia. Putin as the 21st century czar of a country that's known that kind of leadership for a very long time. All kinds of dysfunctionality but the fact is that Russia is resource-rich, well-educated, and nuclear, and that it has never been at ease with any of its neighbors. If there's one thing to be more nervous about than a bear, it's a wounded bear, and that is what Russia has been since the 1990s. Japan, to what extent is the possibility of a revision of the Japanese constitution, a real issue. Arbenomics, certainly in the mind of Abe, was never about just economics. It is about positioning the government such that they can contemplate revising the, art, uh, the, the constitution and removing Article 9. I think Modi, to go back to India for one second, reminds me of Erdogan in some ways. Both of them are trying to do something in very different circumstances which is quite similar, which is to roll back a secularizing independence heritage, the heritage of Nehru in the case of India, the heritage of Kemal Ataturk in the case of Turkey. 
and to dig deeper into more ancient cultural roots and to build a new identity on that basis. This may or may not be trouble-free. Iran, a country with 2,500 years of history behind it, a country where every taxi driver can recite to you some of uh, the greatest poets' output, a country which is a proud, complex Shiite citadel which was never just another Muslim state. And watch Saudi Arabia. And meanwhile, what of Europe? Dean Acheson, the uh, Truman's Secretary of State, famously said of the British that they'd lost an empire and not yet found a role. In a sense, uh, by the way, I think that's still true of Britain, and Brexit proves it, but in a sense, that's true not just of Britain, but of Europe more generally. It's true of the French. It's true of Germany. It's true of Europe as a whole, that we've lost empires and not yet found our place in the world. And so there are rising risks. There will be areas of the world where there are tensions. We all know about the South China Sea. Uh, we, we should not forget the extent to which India feels encircled by the developments of the Belt and Road Initiative, particularly when one of the particular branches of the Belt and Road Initiative, which is taking place on the ground, is the development of a corridor through Pakistan to a new port on the Persian Gulf. And where at the other side, the possibility of a Kunming to Singapore railway leaves India with a sense, and I got this uh, uh, refreshed again just these last few days, a sense of being encircled. And one of the big questions will be over the coming generation too, is how India gets integrated into this great new initiative. And in all of this, even more important than the Indian question is the question of the US and China. The US, in some disarray at the moment, at least in terms of the administration, though, as I said, never short in America for very long. Some of the difficulties, though, are deeper than Trump. It wasn't Trump who took a negative view of the founding of the Asia, of the AIIB. It wasn't Trump who dragged his feet over decades, actually, over the reform of the IMF and the World Bank. TTIP is probably dead in the water, and it was in deep trouble before Trump, and it wasn't only he, but also his opponent who was campaigning against TTIP. So the problems of America's engagement with the world that it is finding more complicated are not just due to Trump. So the longer term question of the extent to which a new Chinese orientation to the global order can come together with an American understanding which is summed up, of course, in its great constitutional phrase uh, of the uh, life, liberty, and, hap and, uh, the, uh, and the pursuit of happiness how those two views of what the world is can come together in some kind of a synthesis in the coming decades is one that matters to us all. It matters to us all um, for the peace of nations, and of course it matters from the point of view of successful, vibrant investment and economic growth. And so I end with the thought that Xi Jinping thought Marx a major new phase, uh, and I venture to say in human history, I think that we are living in the most important time, certainly since 1989, possibly since 1945, arguably even since 1914. I am at the end of the day an optimist, however, so I mentioned 1914 with some trepidation. I don't think there is any reason to believe it has to end that way. On the contrary, I believe that the future is bright, but we do need to be careful. Thank you.